Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today's question comes from Patrick R. Connolly, KO4QLU. And he says, I'm a fairly new ham and want to start building different wire antennas. Good for you. This is often, uh, it's the antenna is the first construction project that a ham tries uh, by himself or herself. He says, I just can't keep straight when a 1 to 1, 4 to 1, or 49 to 1 ballon is required. I believe if I am wanting a multi-band wire, I will require a ballon. But if I'm making a band-specific antenna, then I really don't need one. Not really. Do you have a good reference about ballons? Well, the ARRL antenna book is good. Also, the ARRL uh, radio amateurs handbook is good. Um, and there are countless articles. Uh, one of the things that you can do in any of the books, and let's take a look <clears throat> at the antenna handbook. Uh, to see how this works. If you go to the uh, end of any chapter, there will be a references and bibliography. Okay. And also when you start a new chapter, uh, there is a reference down here to the supplemental, if I can get it up there, supplemental articles that come with the um, well in this case it's on a on a CD but in the case of if you buy for example the uh, electronic version of the ARRL handbook they'll be in a separate set of files and, and there's some very good and there are some very good articles in there that you can take a look at Okay, so let's take a look at the balance that you mentioned and see when we need them. We'll look up here at the overhead. Um, this is a dipole. Okay, uh, this distance from here to here is one half wavelength. Remember, we use the Greek letter lambda for wavelength. So, for example, for a 40 meter antenna, a half of that would be 20 meters or about 66 feet so this is 66 feet for a uh, 40 meter dipole the whole thing now you've got each of these is one quarter wave or 33 feet on a side okay and right in here this is uh, the impedance there is anywhere from 30 to about 75 ohms depending on circumstances. Remember, the first rule of antennas is that everything affects everything. So uh, in this case, height will affect the impedance um, and nearby, uh, you know, like a nearby metal shed or uh, something like that uh, is going to affect impedance. But it's somewhere between 30 and 75 ohms balanced. Now, balanced means that this and this, uh, in RF terms, move opposite each other, okay? So, um, you need to use, the, the coax cable is unbalanced. Now, we assume, generally, we make the assumption that the antenna is 50 ohms. Now, that's not a perfectly good assumption, but if we feed it with 50 ohm cable, then we have a, a transceiver that's 50 ohms. Everything is copacetic. Now the fact that this can go from 30 to 75 means that the best you may be able to do is about a 1.6 SWR, okay? Now you've got a tuner, in most radios have, HF radios have tuners, uh, so you can take something like this and bring it down to one-to-one, uh, -to -one, which is very nice. The transceiver is very happy at that. And the slight difference in SWR is not going to make any difference. There will be a very slight loss in the coax, but 
not enough to worry about in normal uh, circumstances, unless you're trying some very, very weak signal mode or so on. But on HF, um, you know, the noise floor of the band is above S0. It's already here. So if you can do something that improves your ability to hear by 1 dB, that might make it down to here. Not going to be that much difference. Okay, at HF. At HF. And that's not true so much 12 and 10 meters, but they act more like BHF in that manner. Okay, so what would you put uh, one to one ballon? Well, we assume that this is 50 ohms here and here. And both ways we're looking at 50 ohms, okay? Now, here's the thing. This is balanced because it's, it's unbalanced because it's uh, coax. This is balanced because it's got two equal sides, okay? And so this is where you would put a one to one balance, balanced um, to unbalanced. Okay, and you'd put it the balanced side over here and the unbalanced side um, down over here. And usually if these are pre-made, they have two lugs to attach the wire to and a place to screw on the coax. And we take bal, B-A-L, un, and that gives us ballon. Okay. So there you have it. That is where you would use a one-to-one -one ballon. If you want to, uh, I have not had good luck with one-to-one -one ballons at the center of uh, dipoles. Um, personally, my experience has been just skip them, connect the coax directly to the antenna. Um, but you may find that does not work or gives you too much RFI, in which case you could put a bell in there. You may also want to put some um, ferrite beads down there, and this should be connected to a uh, lightning surge protector down here before it goes into the house anyway, which will ground the outside of that shield. Okay, enough on one one balance. Where would you use a four to one balance? Four to one balance are remarkably common, and I'm not sure that they are for any good reason. Let's take another antenna here, this and this. So this is at the one third point right here. And you have, this is a dipole for some frequency. Okay. And this is one half lambda for that frequency. Now, at the one third point, if instead of feeding it in the middle, you're feeding it at the one third point, the impedance at this point right here can be anything from 200 to 500 ohms, depending again on the first rule of antennas. Everything affects everything. Now, 400 is a nominal impedance for the one-third point. So you would put a four to one ballon at this point, okay? There's another way of doing it the way MFJ does it, which is two coils. One is a four to one bell, bell, okay, connected to a one to one bell, un. So the un is the coax. This is balanced to balance. It's a four to one and so on. And that's where you'd put your four to one ballon right there on that line. Now this will create an off center fed dipole. Now, I want you to see that D right there. You see that D? That is dipole. An off-center fed dipole is still a dipole. A dipole does not need to be fed in the center. It can be fed anywhere along the line as long as you match the input impedance. 
the impedance of the line at that point. Remember, it's on the order of 50 here. It's on the order of 200 here, okay? And it's still a dipole. Now, the next thing that you can do is end feed it. And let's talk about the end fed half wave dipole. By the way, uh, before I, I go on, I want to mention that the one third fed dipole is good for the band on which it is cut. Okay, it's also double that frequency, and there are some multiples higher than that. For example, if this is a 40 meter dipole, 40 meter uh, band, a dipole for the 40 meter band, which means 20 meters long, okay, this will work also well on 20 meters, okay, and um, this uh, will also work on six and ten, okay. By the way, the reference antenna is the MFJ MFJ twenty ten, which is an off-center fed. Half-wave dipole, it works on 40 and 20, which are your most popular bands right now. Now that the sunspots are getting better, you'll also get stuff on the higher bands. So you may want to go for an NFED half-wave because it can be good on all the bands above it. So this is some lambda over 2 for the lowest frequency. And the one I've tested was an end Let's see, it was, yeah, N fed half wave, and it works on 80 through 10 meter ham bands except 60. It doesn't work on 60. Okay, now, this is where you've got a 49 to 1 ballon, which assumes that that's 2250 ohms right there. Well, you know the first rule of antennas. Everything affects everything. So that may or may not be a good match. Now, in when I put up uh, my, my antennas dot com, infed halfway of 80 through 10, you can also get 75 through 10 and 40 through 10. Uh, dipole up, I did it as an inverted V with this is the high point which was only 20 feet. And these were down about eight feet at the ends. Now, here's a problem. This is a 49 to one anun. And it's often made with an auto transformer. Okay, so you'll have uh, 14 turns and it'll come through like this and then this will be uh, two, two turns, two turns here, and this is the center conductor, and this is the shield on the coax. And this attaches to the antenna. The question is, what do you do with this? Okay, so this is a 49 to one, unbalanced, since this is ground, Okay, unbalanced to unbalanced or unun. Okay, U-N-U-N. -U -N. I doubt that you will find any spelling dictionary that will recognize that. You'll have to add that word to your spelling dictionary. Now, <clears throat> wait a minute. 14 and 2, that makes the turn ratio 7 to 1. Right? But remember, we'll call this the turns ratio, TR, okay? But the impedance difference is the turns ratio squared. And I won't take you through the mathematics that shows that, but 7 to 1 will give you 49 to 1. Now, why... 49 to 1 dipole, why not 50? Uh, first of all, it's nice to have an integer number of turns, okay? You can create other ratios if you want. 
Now, in theory, if you look at a dipole in theory, okay, you look at a dipole in theory, let's create, you know, a lot of people are colorblind to green, so I try not to use green. Um, let's just use blue. Um, yeah, I had a specific request from some people. Please don't use green. A lot of people have trouble seeing it. My dad was blue-green colorblind. He was in the Navy. Um, as far as I know, I've passed all my colorblindness tests, but I still have trouble telling the difference between cyan and blue. And I know that at night there are um, business establishments that have blue signs, and they're just a blue blur to me. I have a very hard time focusing on blue. And I think it's because I'm a male. It's males generally who have blue-green color blindness. Um, when I did a bunch of color photography at a color darkroom, and I had to learn the difference between cyan and blue, because if a picture had a cyan cast to it, I had to add red. If it had a blue cast to it, I had to add yellow. Two very different things. Okay, I was going to tell you a little bit about dipoles. Okay, here's a dipole. We don't care how it's fed. Um, the voltage here, it, it goes like this, like a sine wave. This is the RF voltage. RF voltage. So the voltage is highest at the end, right here. And so if you touch it there, you can get a whale of a shock. Now the current is the opposite. The RF current, I'm measuring this with an RF voltmeter, these are not standing waves. The current is highest in the middle. Uh, for one reason, there's no place for the current to go at the ends. Okay, so current is low at the ends because there's no place for those electrons to go. All yeah, right, and the voltage is highest here. Well, now the impedance, remember E equals IR. Okay, um, let's look at the resistance. The resistance then, uh, we move this over here, we get E over I is the resistance. Well, remember that resistance can have a reactive component, in which case we call it Z for impedance. Impedance is resistance plus taking properly into account the reactance. Okay, Z equals E over I. Well, here if this is E and this is I, voltage, current, okay, in the center the voltage is technically zero, so the impedance at this point is zero. Again, according to theory. In actual practice, that's not true. In actual practice, it's about 30 to 75 ohms. Okay? Now, if you look at the end, here the current is zero, so we get a Z equal to infinity, because you're dividing by zero. Okay, now in actual practice, that's supposed to be an infinity, in actual practice, it's thousands of ohms. Okay, and here is um, less than 100 ohms and greater than about 30 ohms. And this is the uh, impedance at the center. Okay, so um, when you match it at the end, you've got to match it with those thousands of ohms. Uh, now, the 49 to 1 ballon will give you 2250 ohms, which is pretty good. Now, remember I drew that ballon a little while ago with the turns this way, and this was two turns, and the total turns here was seven, and that's from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, from the bottom, and this part right here, again, is grounded. And this is your coax, 
and this goes to the end of the antenna. What do you do with this? Well, this is where the idea of a counterpoise comes in. A counterpoise is there's a very hazy definition of it. If you look it up in uh, the dictionary, the electrical definition of that is that of a, uh, a tuned radio or something like that. But ham radio uses the term rather more loosely. And I don't know any place where the common usage is written down. So I'll just give you the common usage. The common usage is something for the antenna to work against. And it doesn't have to be a radial. It could be something that is capacitive, inductive, anything that can store some energy for a moment and give it back, okay, which would tend to lead you toward something reactive. Uh, now let's look at this shield of the coax. It is grounded at your ground rod. I hope not at your rig. I hope you ground it outside before you bring it in. And I recommend that you get yourself a lightning surge suppressor uh, like the ones if you go to the reference station. Reference. And that's decastler.com slash reference. Okay, the, the actual specifics for the lightning arrestor there. This can act as the counterpoise for this antenna here because they're all connected together at this point. Or you can just hang a piece of wire down like 10 or 20 feet long, something like that. Just something to put a little reactance on there so that it acts as a counterpoise. In my case, when I tested it, my coax was 50 feet long because that's how long my test coax is. I use uh, spot number one on my um, switch is for the um, antenna under test. And it goes to 50 foot long piece of RG213. So that's a nice long thing to act as a counterpoise for that. And it worked very, very well. So that's something that you can do with the antennas. Let's see. I believe if I'm wanting a multiband wire, it would require a balance. But if I'm making a band-specific antenna, then I don't really need one. Well, that's not actually what's going on. Uh, I showed you places where you could use a 1 to 1, a 4 to 1, and a 49 to 1 ballon. Okay. Now, the 49 to 1 ballon will give you a multi-band antenna. Or you can use it on a single band. If you make a single band dipole, that is fed at the center, which is the most common by far. Okay, fed at the center. So you've got the center of the coax going here and the inside of the coax going here. There's no un un or no ballon there. That probably will work just fine for a single band. You may even be able to load it up on another band. For example, if this is 40 meters, um, it... Um, will probably also work on 15 meters with a tuner. You can, if you want, put a one-to-one -one ballon here. And I know a lot of people who do and are very successful with it. Personally, I found better success working it that way. In fact, I put a, a, a video together about how to make a 40 meter dipole really easily. Uh, just with old electrical wire and some electric fence insulators, which you can get at any farm store, farm store for super cheap. So anyway, a single band antenna like this, a single band dipole, uh, you don't need it, I think, but a lot of people find it easier to do it with it. So if you buy the MFJ single band dipoles, they don't have uh, ununs or balans or anything like that. However, the 2010, the MFJ 2010, which is a quad band um, dipole on 4020 um, 
10 and 6. Cover part of 10, part of 6. Covers all of 40, all of 20. Um, it does have the, the Bellin arrangement in it for it to work. So I hope that gives you a little bit of help there. Do I have a good reference on Bellin's? No, I don't. And I'm looking for one. I am looking for one specifically because balans are usually made using toroids, um, unless you do a choke balan, but that's a whole other topic in itself. Uh, and I have looked for a good reference on toroids and not found one. So if you have a good one, please put it in the comments or send it to me at hamradioanswers at gmail.com or better yet at askdave at arrl.org. So there you have it. If you've made it this far, please be sure to subscribe and click like. Also, you can go to dcastler.com support and look for ways to financially support this channel. Also, go to dcastler.com giveaway to find out what our giveaway is this month and how to enter for it. It's completely free. The only thing it costs you is a postage stamp. And if you want to save a little bit, you can send it on a postcard, which will save you even more money. Until we next meet, 73.